Good morning, everyone. I'm Ann Christensen, a licensed prayer practitioner here at Light on the Mountains. And it is now time to take a deep breath, get rid of all the stuff that it took to get you here this morning, and let's go quietly within. I know that there is one universal spirit, one infinite intelligence, one divine presence, one creative force. That force, that presence, that spirit, that intelligence is all there is. But it is in everything in the universe. It is right here within each one of us. And I know that we all can be in touch with it. It is the best part of us. And it is right, oops, it is right there, right now, for each and every one of us. I give thanks for that and for this philosophy. I give thanks uh, for everyone who makes Light on the Mountains work, and there are quite a few, and I just looked in the back, and Donna's got a whole spread today, and she's been busy at it, and uh, I know that uh, John has a perfect talk this morning, and RL and Max, are already presenting us with perfect music. I'm so grateful for that, for the Leadership Council, my fellow practitioners, and all the other volunteers who we don't really see at work, but they are there. And s together we should say to right now, thanks to them, and so it is. Okay, um, the reading this morning is from the March issue of the Science of Mind magazine. And I don't always uh, get so ecstatic about the magazine, but I was looking for just what I wanted to say this morning or what I wanted to read. And, you know, I get out the books and things. But this issue, I started in it, and I couldn't stop. And I think I read every single thing in the issue. And we're going to read one, one part of, of one part of it. <laughs> as soon as Barbara gets her phone fixed. <laughs> is, it, is it fixed? Oh, oh, Siri will do it for me if you, <laughs> on mine, my new phone. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you, Dinah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, th the theme for this issue is cultivating auth authenticity, and John's blog was about uh, how we can, I, can't, I don't want to say too much about his blog, but how we can change our, our lives uh, and be what we want to be, and I'm sure he will say more of that. And so... Everything in here is about authenticity, and uh, I kept saying, oh, I could read that, oh, I could read this, but no. <laughs> now, we're going to start with a couple of, of statements here. This is an uh, article, uh, Embracing Our Divine Authentic Humanness by Diana Ensign, and uh, there's a little quote up at the top of the beginning of this by Anais Nin. Uh, and the day came when the risk of to remain tight in a bud was more painful than the risk it took to blossom. Some of us may have heard before. And then uh, there's another uh, state, big statement at the bottom of this page. But ultimately, everyone loses out whenever anyone is excluded. That's what got me because that's what our world needs right now. And uh, let's see. Okay, we... Okay, i got to be sure I start at the right place because otherwise it'll be too oh, too long. I okay, I'm sorry, I didn't... I got into this late last night trying to make it sort of shorter. I, th I think this is where I'm supposed to start. The How of Authenticity. It's essential to understand what authenticity is, but equally important is how we get to the point where we live authentic authentically. 
more of the time than not. I believe it is born of quiet consistency in the commitment to understand, know, and embody who we truly are. Spirit in expression with all its myriad qualities, including love, joy, peace, abundance, and creativity. That's who we really are. Quiet consistency involves consciously dedicating ourselves to a spiritual path of unfoldment. It is necessary to acknowledge that this is a daily, even minute-to-minute, lifelong journey. There is no arrival, no finish line, and living authentically requires maintenance. Those of us who seek to live authentically employ a symphony of spiritual practices, meditation, prayer, visioning, spiritual study, reading, journaling, and being in spiritual community that continually support and challenge us to go deeper, to reach into our depths and truly allow for an ever fuller expression of our divinity. In this quest to cultivate authenticity, the question to ask is, what would love do? Love with a capital L. What would love do? This opens a portal where a person can set ego aside and act from that place of oneness and unconditional love. Admittedly, showing up authentically is not always easy. It involves becoming an observer of our own behavior and catching ourselves in the act of being unauthentic and then pivoting to that place of a loving, non-judgmental response. Coming to this place is, again, the result of quiet persistence in spiritual practice. Challenging situations are a signal. They are invitations from our divine selves, the divine is capitalized, to examine our authenticity and to make life-affirming choices. We are always at a point of choice about how we act and react. From a place of spiritual maturity and awareness, when we see ourselves straying down the road of egoic reaction, we can put on the brakes, choose to allow our authentic self to be expressed instead. Again, quiet persistence in daily spiritual practice helps us to be able to do that. Um, okay. Wayne Dwyer talked about keeping the link between ourselves and spirit clean. I love this visual. I like to ask myself, how is my link? Am I keeping my link strong and clean, or am I allowing it to get dirty, rusty, and corroded? Uh, We can tell when our own thoughts or actions are corrosive and when they are healthy and strengthening, but we have to stop it to ask the question, evaluate the thoughts. In his book, Your Essential Self, The Inner Journey to Authenticity and Spiritual Enlightenment, Richard Harvard wrote, Harvey wrote, as we center ourselves in authenticity, we respond to the world, other people, and events in an entirely different way. As we think and act differently, we produce different results in our experience. Our days are filled with loving and pleasant interactions. Our lives just simply flow in every way. Um, Okay. I invite you to commit to living more authentically than you ever have. View it as your contribution um, to peace on the planet by radiating the love that you truly are in every situation. You uplift the consciousness of humanity. Uh, And then at the very bottom, it says in big letters, what would love do? in our spiritual quest to cultivate authenticity. That's the primary question to ask. So I recommend this, but it's really hard to know where to stop and start. Okay. Now, it is time for our affirmation, which is on the little insert in red uh, at the top. Affirmation for March, the matter of matter. Affirmation, oh, we, we must read this one together, uh, and let's do it right now. I release and let go in preparation for a greater transformation. And now, 
it's time for real music. Good. Real music. Thank you, and good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, th thanks for joining in and singing this morning. That was nice. We're going to sing again at the end of the service together. Um, a thought of the day. Um, how many of you have said recently, you know, someone should dot, dot, dot. I've said it a bunch, I think. You know, someone should take care of that. Someone should do that. Someone should do something about that. Someone should. Me too. <laughs> I get worried about. I get worried about it, and then I, and then often it leads back to, maybe what I was saying is, you know, I should. You know, it'd be really great if I. I wonder if I have the capacity. I wonder if I have the knowledge. I wonder if I have the time. I wonder if I have the energy. I wonder if I could start something. I wonder if I could ask someone to. Um, and all of those things seem much more productive than someone should, which usually leads me, leaves me frustrated or angry or um, defeated. And um, uh, so I toss that out. Uh, so someone's going to sing right now. Um, <laughs> that's me. <laughs> um, and someone's going to play. That's Max. And Max is going to maybe, uh, we'll see what happens along the way. I was going to warn you all that um, I was going to use the G word this morning. Last week I was in Max's class with his girls and he said, girls, I just want to tell you I'm going to use the F word. And I was like, oh. frustrated <laughs> was the F word. Well, I was going to use the G word this morning and use God, the God word, um, which I know carries uh, different things for different people. And I was going to suggest that you might substitute whatever word you needed along the way, spirit, uh, uh, universe, love. Um, but then Anne read, and I went, okay, I wonder if I could um, substitute that for you. So uh, this song is called God Is, and it's by Faith Rivera. And I hope Faith won't mind if I m give an attempt to simply substitute the word love for the word God in this song. <laughs> morning, John. Good morning. It's your turn. Okay. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Good morning, everyone at home, even though I suspect those of you at home will be viewing later after a powder day is just my, <laughs> so let, you know, I, not that I'm wonderfully psychic or not, but that's usually the way it goes this time of year. And then we see a lot of people once the mountain closes. It's, it's, it's interesting. It's got to be a coincidence in there somewhere. Interesting, uh, Marl, talking about the, the word God and the energy we put behind that, depending on your upbringing. Um, I think I grew up with a more or less positive experience with that word, even though I have changed that vibration of that word for me personally. But some people don't have a positive um, view of that word because of how they were raised, and we have to honor that. And I have found that there could be a progression that if you come to a place like this and you, and you have some difficulties with words like that, there's a progression where eventually it's okay. And I tell people it's it's an easy word. It's it's three. You know, it's one syllable and backwards spells dog. So I think it really is a sacred <laughs> word. But in that, um, the class that I had just finished teaching, the roots of science of mind, meaning doing, studying some readings of some of the um, initial people in New Thought in the late tw 19th century, early 20th century. And the person we've been re reading that we finished up the class with was Emma Curtis Hopkins. And she is known as a New Thought mystic, and we'll talk about what that means in a moment. But um, she had a different way of presenting the word God that a lot of people resonated with. She used the word God and good interchangeably. So at any time that you would want to evoke a higher power or source, try using the word good because... I think most of us just have positive energy around that word. And that thinking that this whatever this creative force of the universe is, is ultimately good. So it, a lot of people, myself included, with, resonated with the readings of, of those two words being interchangeable. So if that's a, an odd word for you, the G word, um, try good and, and see how that works for you um, this week in any meditations you do, any prayers you do, or um, I don't know, even if you're getting upset and saying, oh God, go, oh good. You know, <laughs> doesn't, that kind of, doesn't that kind of bring a different energy to it? So 
So why was she considered a mystic? And, and first of all, I'm so amazed at um, women who accomplish great things in the 19th century and early 20th century. Not because there aren't plenty of capable women, but how difficult it is, I mean, it's still not today as well, how it is more difficult for women to get the recognition. And I could really go into a lot of things that Emma Curtis Hopkins um, accomplished. And again, when you, it, it would be a bio you would expect to see of a contemporary woman today, not someone from the late 19th century. So it's just amazing. But she was a mystic. And what does that mean? A lot of people confuse mysticism with psychism. And I'm not taking a stand on go to psychics, don't go to psychics. But my mysticism is not making a person who makes predictions about lotto numbers or anything like that. A person who is a mystic lives their life more in the knowledge and experience of being one with creator, with God, with spirit. And when I say that they have the experience as opposed to us intellectually saying, I think I believe that we're all energetic connected and that includes this larger greater power than us we I believe all of us in this room will have little fleeting moments with it like spontaneously you will feel that connection but a mystic kind of hangs out there on a regular basis so when you read writings of like her or someone else who is uh, a mystic it is more from what I call the absolute meaning when she says we are one with spirit with one with God it's again it's not a theory it is how they live their life it's how they experience their life again there's a difference of theory and then you're thrown right in it and that's who you are and how you live so when she writes from the absolute it at first can be off-putting for some people because it almost seems like she is in denial of just the day-to-day -day difficulties of human beings because when she says that, and even in your difficulties, that the presence of the divine of God exists, again, it's not a theory. She experiences it. She sees it. She moves and has her being within that. And if you are just kind of the rest of us, having the challenges of every day to say that it's all good and God in this big old mess that I'm in, it's difficult to comprehend. But that's our, I think, our, our path as human beings, to figure out the goodness and the godness in all things, even when it's not so good. Or say one of my sayings is that, especially people that I know well that I can say certain things to that might be in a period of difficulty or grief, and I'll say it is all good, it is all God, but sometimes it just sucks on the human level. Mm -hmm. And that's just kind of the way it is. And I don't have any way to work through that mystery, but that's kind of the way that it is. So let's take a couple of the things that those of us who were in this class learn from Emma Curtis Hopkins and try to bring it down to earth a little bit. And we're going to do it through one of my favorite topics. We're going, as through my blog, we're going to do it through home improvement shows. <laughs> I love, I think RL joins me on this. We love home improvement shows. This is why I love them. You can see a complete Un what seems to be unlikely transformation happened in someone's home in 60 minutes or less. Isn't that amazing? So you see this mess of a place, and you know that in 60 minutes, it's going to be your dream home as well. And it gives one great faith in the idea that one can have amazing transformation in one hour or less. Isn't it great? Yes. I love it. I love it. Um, and there's many lessons to learn here. Of course, we know that that hour was filmed over a two to six month period. So it wasn't really an hour. But when we say experience grows our faith, I get great faith just from that, that I could transfer, transform my home as well as my life. So let's kind of follow this a little bit of how that works and how, the, believe it or not, you can tune into Emma Curtis Hopkins on Property Brothers, basically. <laughs> so let's start with where we are now, with, as we talked about last week, we are encouraging through this, the, the Christian practice of Lent leading up to Easter to invite transformation. And that this time of year is seen as kind of a stepping back, going within, 
taking some inventory and seeing what you might want to clean out to make room for something else, something new. And it doesn't have to be, when we say transformation, sometimes we can think it's completely starting all over, completely new job, new house, new whatever. And there are times in our life that we're up for the big transformation. A lot of times we're just up for the, you know, the simple transformations, just that little turn inside that makes all the difference. So I don't think that because we're talking about this that it has to be the big thing. It's like, right now in my life, I'm not up for big change. I really like where I am. But there's always that smaller transformations we're looking for. We, we all know that feeling when it's time for the big ones. If that's where you are now, great. If not, transformation is still for you and for me. So how do these Property Brother type shows begin? So you have a designer or a team of designers visit a home without the homeowners there and to take notes of basically what a mess the house is. And so, of course, nothing is working. Walls are where shouldn't be, walls be. There's kitchens from the 1950s. There's wallpaper. There's linoleum. There's just a mess of a stuff. And not only that, people are generally in these shows not really good housekeepers either. <laughs> they usually have piles of stuff. In fact, I think they told her to like, make it as messy as possible. And if they have children, you know that every room is filled with toys and they are tripping over them 24 hours a day. I mean, I don't, I'm not a parent, I don't know what that is, but I do know what it's like to step on a dog toy at 4 a.m. in the morning. Yeah. <laughs> so I can't even imagine if your home is one child location after the next of toys. So they view this, and of course, as we are the viewers, we fall into this. If those who watch these shows, they have a formula. And I fall for them every time. I don't know about you. I never question the formula. I just think, isn't this how we're going on for this hour? So you are with the designers here, and you just all agree that it's a mess. But there is a greater idea of what it could be. But here's the interesting thing. That big old mess, like our lives, if they are dysfunctional, are very, very convincing. It's very convincing to look at a home that just needs some tender, loving care and think that it really can't be different. And even if you feel that it could physically be different, like who has the money, who has the time, who has the ideas, that we convince ourselves that it's not possible. So Emma Curtis Hopkins has a very interesting statement that she makes, and it's very, um, it's very mystic-like because at first, it makes no sense to the rest of us are either non-mystics or part-time mystics. <laughs> and we had great discussion about this as well as other statements in our class. And her statement is simply, there is no matter. What? What do you mean? This feels pretty solid to me. And there's great people reading and sending me emails like, what is this there's no matter stuff sort of thing? So she didn't mean that this does not exist. What she meant is that it's not as solid and unchangeable as you had led yourself to believe. So even looking at this, I mean, it's pr we, we all know from high school science class, remember? Go back to when dinosaurs roamed the Earth for most of us. In this podium, there is more space than matter. That at a cellular level, there are molecules that are in perpetual motion. That it is that motion that it works together with certain elements that keeps this appearing the way that it appears. But its appearance is very convincing, isn't it? I don't expect this to like go into a pool of goo anytime soon. I expect it to be here. In fact, it's been here for several years, and it was owned by Light of the Mountains way before we had this building. So it's been around for a long time. And this whole room is very convincing on a level of matter that there's a permanency in it. But there's really not. 
matter is always in flux. So let's say today we left and we locked the doors and never to return again, and we came back 50 years ahead of time, this room would look quite different. It'd probably be a big old mess because matter is always in a state of flux. There'd probably be a couple holes in the roof with big things of snow in the room and all sorts of things that had hap would have happened if we just left it to its own devices. So as we are looking towards our own personal transformations, she is teaching us, first of all, that the matter in our lives is not permanent. It is always in a state of flux. It is always changing. And that part of our transformational process is to convince ourselves that that is so. That anything we see with our own eyes is just the way it is now. And that can be a difficult thing to do. So we go through this process on home improvement shows. We are, again, given this picture of a home in disarray and the owners as well as the viewers, there's part of us that believe, even though we've seen this formula a million times, they'll never do it this time. So the next step in the process. So there's an interesting thing of, in spirituality or any number of, of consciousness studies, we've all heard this. You need to do the work. Who hasn't heard that? What does that mean? I need to do the work. Well, gosh, that's in so many things. Meaning, first of all, if you are on a path of discovery and transformation, there is, as we say, inner work we need to do, meaning some introspection and reevaluation. But that's not where it ends. Doing the work means that after you do a little bit of in here, you have to step out in the world a bit differently and, in a sense, do that work that aligns with that inner work. So the same is on our our TV shows as well. So here's an interesting thing if you you may have not caught this so much. So the next scene on these shows are basically that we have the designers and the homeowners in the home and the home has already been cleared of all furniture, all things, and, the, and it's empty. And they never really talk about that too much. Think of your own home. What would it take to empty your home? I know. Who would want to do that? <laughs> Doing the work of that not only means just, I'm sure they hire professional movers, but if you were one of these people who were having your home redone, it would be finally, I've been putting off going through that office for 10 years, and now I have to do this paper by paper. There's no excuse for that. A year and a half ago, as most of you know, we moved. We bought a condominium. And even though we were in just a 500 square foot space, there was a month process that we had to go through of painstakingly going through everything that we had avoided going through. That this process of throwing out and, you know, here and putting in boxes and bins and all that so that on moving day, I say, you had to do the work. We really had to do the work. It wasn't like magically the movers are here like, oh, would you mind going through my office things over here first? And see, and you can make, decide whether we bring them or not. No. So this is one aspect of these shows that gets kind of to the wayside. You have no idea how much work those people have already put in to get the empty house. I mean, just think of that. They don't even kind of give it lip service anymore. I mean, like, they haven't really had a rough few weeks. Just know that. Know that the same rough time you would have if you had to do that. But here they are, empty house. We're starting to get into this idea that there is a possibility. There's, there's something here that could happen. It's empty. And the one show I really like is that they, because the next thing is that we now need to start demolishing. And this one show that I like, they, they will usually put sledgehammers in the owner's hands and have them just go at it. And usually that means the cabinetry, walls that we're going to put down. And it's just like, just kind of go have at it to show you again the permanency or the impermanency of matter. And there's nothing like just really getting your hands in it. Just interesting. So to think that, boy, the, the, those cabinets were such prized possessions in this home. And now we're just beating the heck out of it with sledgehammers. I mean, just think of that. Or that wall was my feature wall where I had block wallpaper. 
And we're just kind of going at it sort of thing. We're just really getting down to it just matters and it's changeable and it's time for it to go. Time to be something else. And then the next scene you see, again, it's a formula. You know, write this down, tick it off, watch these shows. Are that are the owners with the designers, with everything having been removed, not just the furniture, but the walls, the cabinetry, the linoleum, the icky carpet they may have had, and it is a clean canvas. Can you imagine your home right now as a clean canvas? Can you even imagine what you would do with it if it was a clean canvas? That's difficult. So I was trying to think, well, how would I do this? I, I pictured myself in the home I grew up in during the 60s and 70s. My parents custom built the home in the late 1950s, and it was, as they say, a mid-century modern in both the good ways and the not-so-good ways. <laughs> I can envision pulling up the gold shag carpeting, you know, the kind you had to rake? I can really envision that happening. I can envision pulling up the linoleum that later the kitchen I don't want my parents thinking, then carpeted the kitchen? Oh my God, what were they thinking? And I can imagine removing all of the plastic flower arrangements that were throughout the home. I can imagine that. But there are other features of it that were more permanent that would even be more difficult from a sledgehammer. And I was even like, what would I, if I suddenly magically inherited that home, what in the world could I do with it? So that's why you need the bigger idea sometimes, to open up to the bigger idea. So if you're stuck even in your own life to think, well, I've got a clean slate, now what? That's the question. Now what? And sometimes the tearing down part is a little bit easier than what are you going to replace it with? And of course, in these shows that they do. You know, matter is impermanent, you have to do the work. And then the other thing I really love from Emma Curtis Hopkins, which is applicable in here. So I'm going to use two words that have a lot of negative energy around them. I just want to like prepare you for this. Uh, so she says, there is no sin and no evil. Let's remind ourselves what Rabbi Ravi told, talk, told us in October about sin. She said that it is a mistranslated word in the Old Testament that meant missing the mark, which as she pointed out was an archery turn, meaning, oh, I missed the target, let's do it again. Let's keep doing it until we hit the target. So it means basically making a mistake. And that there is no sin and there is no evil, meaning there is not an entity out there tempting us to do bad things. The sad and disturbing thing is that we do these terrible things on our own volition. <laughs> and we do it by our own choice. And so as you're doing the house remodel, of course the next part of the remodel is that we're getting ready to do some really good things, and then of course there's drama. The plumbing needs to be replaced, or the electricity isn't up to code. So that's always the thing that they have, oh again, it's such a formula, they have the designer making the phone call. Yes, is this the owner's? Guess what, it's going to cost another $10,000. And they're like, oh, how will we ever find it? Happens on every show. <laughs> and so, and again, there's no evil, there is, um, there's no sin, there is only mistakes. So in that, it's not like some nefarious entity came in and messed up your wiring. It's just the last electrician didn't really know what they were doing. So you either fix it or don't fix it, but it's neutral. It is what it is, as they say. So that's the other thing she said, it's don't take it personally. You can rise above it and make a correction. And of course, at the end of these shows, everyone is just through the moon, over the moon, excited about what happens. That in a sense, their faith of what can happen has been elevated and happy ending, so to speak. But of course, it's not always how things seem to happen all the time, do they? I think that we're on an ongoing remodel job. <laughs> Even on these shows, here's a little secret you may not know. So, in fact, if you've ever watched those, wouldn't you say, can't I just have those people come do my house? 
<laughs> like they, it's, they don't make it look like, quote unquote, the model homes at, at new track home places. They even do, you know, family pictures and the little knickknacks, but not too crazy that it looks like it's just been, you know, that it's you, so to speak. And I thought, God, I just need someone to Property Brothers our place, like, to do that. But here's what you don't realize is that, which is kind of the underbelly of these shows, everything that's been put there, if they want to keep it, they have to buy it. So you have to think, so I know my old couch with an inch of dog hair on it is in the garage. I have a choice here. Do I bring that back in the house or do I pay the extra here? So it's, it's the constant constant transformation. It's constantly making choices. There's never ultimately a point of arrival where you never have to move again. There is no matter. It's always in flux. You always have to do the, that next level of work. So that's what I believe this time of year is about or what we can remind ourselves about. That it is always stepping forward in a sense in faith a little bit that we will find footing as we transform and move forward. I just want to close with, I had an amazing, interesting dream last night about this. You know, that usually it's, it'll be s significant, the one that you have just before you wake up, and you're just like, I gotta remember that. So anyways, I was in front of a trash chute. And it was a trash chute that I was familiar with. So growing up, my parents for about three years and when we were in grade school, they leased a condo at the beach to give us a vacation home. Still kept our home, still kept the plastic flowered, you know, um, shag carpeting home, still had that, we're giving that up. Um, and they had, and this was a 30 story building and we were on the 25th floor. And it had a trash chute. And can I tell you how much fun grade school kids can have with the trash chute that goes 30 <laughs> floors? Can I even tell you what we experimented with throwing down that trash chute that our parents had no ideas that we were doing? Usually it was, what can make the most noise? And, you know, like glass things and like, you know, how far can we go down? Well, you know, so we had a lot of time with the trash chute. Anyways, so you know what a trash chute basically is. In this dream, I'm in that room with the trash chute. And I open it up and there's someone there and the invitation is to jump in. That's scary, isn't it? Mm -hmm. The unknown, I mean, can you see kind of the connection here? Um, so when I opened it up, so you know what you would normally see, but when I opened it up, it was a green screen, meaning, do you know how movie special effects are done? So if you see like pictures of them doing special effects, like Superman flying through the air, He's actually on a cable in front of a green wall because they can very easily, through ways that I don't understand, put the background. So it is a neutral background that they put on whatever they want. Get where I'm going now? So when I opened this up, it was the green screen, meaning the invitation was to jump in and I could make it whatever I want. In fact, it had one person who jumped in before me and you're thinking, oh, you're gonna hear all these things, and it just was like, oof. And so my choice, as I woke up, was, will I be next? Isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. So that really shows that matter is not permanent. Sometimes we need to take a leap of faith in areas that we wouldn't normally do. So with that, my invitation for you this week is to further go into this this invitation of transformation. What do you want to clear out internally, externally? What do you want to invite in? So let's take this within for a moment here. And let's give thanks for being here. Let's give thanks for everyone who's at home. Let's give thanks for everyone who will join us on the live stream recording later after they get home from their wonderful day on the slopes. And know that regardless of where you are, what you're doing, or when you do it, that it is absolutely perfect right here and right now that in a sense, the power of God and good is in every spot that we inhabit, every thought that we have. Anything that we create, anything we let go, it is all good and it is all God. And we just allow ourselves to rest into that. And as we do that through this process of these 
40 days leading up to Easter, we intuitively know, in this knowing, what it is time to say goodbye to. And we know intuitively what it is time to welcome in as a new experience. Again, it is all good. It is all God. So we allow ourselves to just be with that, to not judge that, to allow these answers or remodelings to come in in their own time, and we commit to do the work as needed. So in this we give thanks, and in this Thanksgiving, we simply, joyously, and lovingly release it and let it go. And so we say together, and so it is. Mm -hmm.